In the second session of the Ohio State University Nysonger Center, Building Bridges Echo, we will hear from Dr. Kristen Cooper, Associate Medical Director of the Center for Autism Services and Transition, and an Assistant Professor in the Division of General Internal Medicine, who will be providing a lesson on differentiating mental health from physical health and other factors. Today's learning objectives will be to define challenging behavior and its impact while reviewing considerations for potential triggers of challenging behavior, to be able to discuss initial approaches to new concerns of challenging behavior with consideration for evaluation of medical conditions as a cause for behavior changes and a consideration of environmental factors as a cause for behavioral changes. Lastly, we'd like you all to be able to discuss methods to help communicate concerns and individual symptoms during appointments. We'll also take some time to review the mental health passport tool. At this time, I welcome my Dr. Cooper to the stage and she'll be sharing her slides with us. Welcome, Dr. Cooper. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew, how does that look on everyone's end? Can can everybody see my slides? Yes, it looks great. Perfect. Well, thank you guys again for, for having me today. Um, again, my name is Kristen Cooper. I am a physician at Ohio State and a little bit about my background. So I am a primary care doctor um, and I'm board certified in both pediatrics and internal medicine, meaning that I have the opportunity to take care of patients of all ages. And as Andrew mentioned, I'm also the Associate Medical Director of the Ohio State CAST program, which is a program that provides primary care for adult patients with autism. So my hope for this talk is to share a little bit about how I, as a primary care doctor, approach concerns related to challenging behavior in my patients with IDD. Um, and again, why it's important for us to consider both medical and environmental factors prior to considering the possibility of underlying mental health diagnoses. Um, and I will admit, I come at this from a little bit from a lens specific to autism, but I think that the things that we'll review in this talk are applicable to all of our patients with IDD. So here are our objectives, as already mentioned by Andrew. So let's start with talking about challenging behavior and, and really what is challenging behavior? Um, it's defined as any pattern of behaviors that are harmful either to the patient or the individual or to others. Uh, these are behaviors that can be destructive, that contribute to the isolation of the individual, and that prevent access to learning and to full participation in the community. So some examples of common challenging behaviors include self-injurious behavior, aggression toward others, tantrums, property destruction, and elopement. It's been said that approximately 50% of individuals with IDD experience some form of challenging behavior. And actually a meta-analysis conducted in 2003 found that children and adults with autism were even more likely than other people with IDD to display self-injury or aggression. So types of challenging behavior. Um, why do we care? I mean, why do we care about challenging behavior? So certainly um, these behaviors have many negative impacts, including stigmatization, uh, rejection by peers, even family members and staff. Um, these behaviors can lead to placement in restricted settings, such as specialized education, segregated residential settings, and institutionalization. Um, certainly, these behaviors can have health risks, such as injuries, lacerations, and so forth. Um, of course, these behaviors can have significant impacts on family members' mental health and well-being. And then often, these behaviors lead to the need for psychotropic medications, which come with their own risks of uh, side effects. And actually, um, Audits of practice reveal some worrying results. So in 2004, there was um, a study which surveyed the charts of a little over 100 people with IDD. 
And the study found that practitioners failed to follow local practice consensus guidelines in all cases of people taking psychotropic medications. Further, in 96% in of these folks who were on the psychotropic medications, practitioners rarely defined the challenging behavior for which the medication was prescribed and rarely provided adequate monitoring. So these are worrisome findings. People with intellectual and developmental disabilities are unfortunately often defined by their behavior. Um, and a major takeaway that I'd like people to take with them today is that behavior is communication. It's really not a symptom of a person's disability. And so any change in baseline behavior should prompt an evaluation for, for an underlying source of pain or other contributing medical factor. Um, in my practice, um, I see many patients with limited verbal communication. And so I think the things that we'll discuss today are going to be more so applicable to this population. So our nonverbal patients or our limitedly verbal patients. Um, however, I think this information can be applicable to all of our patients with IBD. Um, we genuinely rely on the information that's provided by caregivers whether it's staff, family members, behavioral support specialists, you guys tend to know patients best, right? You're with them day in and day out. And so we ask that you please, please let us know about new and changing behaviors. So I thought we'd start with um, an example case. Um, Trey is an 18 year old male with a history of autism and mild intellectual disability who presents with his mom for a two month history of poor appetite and behavior concerns. Mom mentions that Trey has been with intermittent episodes characterized by yelling, hitting, and biting his hands. Mom is worried that something is wrong. See, so when, when I hear a case like this, where do I start? The first question I always try to ask is whether the patient has displayed these behaviors in the past. Um, and if so, was there an identified cause at that time? I can't tell you how many times I've seen patients for concern um, of behavior change. And when I ask families, hey, has this ever happened before? They'll say, oh, you know what? Actually, so-and-so showed similar behaviors a number of years ago. And we later found at that time that he had had an arm injury after a fall, had a fractured arm. Um, but for the sake of our scenario today, let's say that we ask mom this question and she says, these are totally new behaviors. They've never happened before. Where do I go from here? So I found this helpful kind of framework um, that was adapted from the 2018 Canadian Consensus Guidelines on Primary, primary Care of Adults with IDD. So we'll use this framework of HELP um, as kind of an initial framework to work through. The H stands for health. So first we want to assess for possible physical health problems that might explain a change in behavior. Next for E, we want to consider environmental factors that could be a cause of, of changing behaviors or new behaviors. The L stands for life, life changes or experiencing. So we want to screen for distressing life changes or experiences. And then lastly, the P is to consider psychiatric conditions. And I think the order of this framework makes a lot of sense too. So starting with kind of physical problems, then environmental factors and life changes. And then lastly, considering psychiatric conditions. So we'll start with assessing for those possible health problems. Um, some general questions to consider. Have there been any recent illnesses? Any recent it known injuries? Or any new physical symptoms that haven't already been mentioned? When I see a patient um, in the office, so patient similar to Trey, I will conduct what's called um, a review of systems as well of, as, of course, my physical exam. So a review of systems is essentially just going head to toe 
and asking, um, in the case of my nonverbal patients, asking staff or caregivers about any symptoms that my patient might have been experiencing. So for example, any headaches or any gesturing to their head, any cold-like symptoms, any belly pain, you know, holding their belly, any nausea, diarrhea, any obvious um, wounds, right, bruising, uh, joint injuries, and so forth. Um, and certainly in our, in our patients with IDD, we always have to, unfortunately, uh, keep the possibility of abuse or neglect sort of in the back of our mind. So I'll always keep an eye out for unexplained injuries or bruises, you know, monitor the caregiver patient interactions. So some example uh, medical causes of behavioral changes. And these are ones that I would see, I would say that I see most commonly. Constipation, headache, pain associated with menses, um, ear infections, UTIs, seizures, um, dental infections. Acid reflux is a big one, um, actually, I see all the time. And consideration um, for side effects from medication. So. Um, I really often in these scenarios, I view myself as a little bit of a detective, right? So in our patients who aren't able to provide us a clear history, um, we really have to kind of put our detective hats on to start to try to sort out what's going on. And so I think these can be helpful for, for caregivers or staff to consider as well. Think about the timeline of when these behaviors started. Think back if they started two weeks ago, what was happening around that time? Was there a new medication introduced? Was a prior medication discontinued? Was there a change in a dose of a medication? Was the patient sick around that time? Just as examples. So after considering those um, health causes, the physical health causes, we next want to assess for possible environmental factors. So some questions to consider. Were there any recent changes in a person's environment? So for instance, um, did they move? Did they change living environments? Perhaps they were previously with a guardian or a loved one and now they're in a group home setting as an example. Um, who else lives in the home with them? Perhaps they're still living with parent or guardian, but an older sibling moved out or in. Um, any changes to their school environment? Did they just graduate from their high school program and now they're in more of a day have setting um, and so forth? And then certainly any recent stressors or traumatic events, perhaps there was an illness in the family and a loved one was hospitalized. So let's return to the case a little bit. So mom denies any known recent illnesses or injuries for Trey. When conducting that sort of head-to-toe um, review of systems and physical exam, she does mention that she thinks his stomach's maybe been bothering him, as she's noticed that sometimes he's pressing on his stomach, which is a new behavior for him. She also notes that over the last couple of weeks, Trey has been having liquid stool leakage um, into his underwear every so often, so she thinks he's been having diarrhea. So. Given um, the worry about suspected belly pain with Trey pressing on his stomach and this report of stool accidents, I gather a little bit more info from mom about what exactly she's been noticing. So in addition to the liquid stool leakage, she notes that Trey is also actually having intermittent hard stools and he seems to be in the bathroom for like longer and longer periods. So he's independent with toileting, so mom can't exactly always see what's going on, but he seems to be spending like long periods in the bathroom. On my exam, his belly feels full, like um, a little bit distended, but there's no obvious tenderness um, with pressing on his abdomen. So we come to discover that Trey has what's called onchoparesis. So this is the medical term for uh, liquid stool leakage, that occurs when hard impacted stool collects in um, the colon, which is the end of the large intestine. 
So the colon becomes too full, and subsequently what happens is liquid stool starts to leak around the hard retained stool. So often, um, families and staff will see the liquid stool and suspect that the, the problem is underlying diarrhea, when in actuality, constipation is the underlying problem. So for Trey, um, we start him on a stool softening regimen, and after a few days, mom reports back and says that his appetite has returned to normal, and he seems to be, you know, back to his usual baseline. So some tips um, for how to discuss the symptoms and concerns um, during medical visits with, with providers. Um, firstly, I would say so often, you know, um, when, we, when we see patients during visits, unfortunately, the system is such that we often have a limited, limited amount of time um, for visits. And so I recommend listing concerns based on priority. So we, I think it's easy to say, hey, you know, we have a list of X, Y, Z to talk about today, but definitely start with the most pressing concern. Some information that would be, you know, super helpful for us to receive during these visits. So, um, for instance, when presenting a concern about a new challenging behavior, it's helpful for us to understand when did it start? So what's been the time frame? Again, is this something that's happened previously? Say it was three years ago and then resolved and then started back a month ago. That's really helpful for us. Also, the frequency can be helpful. So is this a behavior that's happening persistently on a consistent basis since it began? Or is this more of an intermittent behavior? Um, if it's intermittent, how often is it happening? Once a week, once a month, once a day? Um, it's helpful for us to understand whether the behavior has worsened over time, improved over time, or perhaps it's just stayed the same. Some other things to consider um, and info to provide would be, have you noticed whether there's any factors that seem to correlate with improved symptoms? So for instance, in the, in the example of Trey, let's say that mom notes that after she believes that he's had a bowel movement because he's been in the bathroom for a long period of time, he seems to feel better for a couple of days. And then the behaviors ramp up again. Um, conversely, are there any factors that seem to worsen symptoms? So for example, um, in my patients who I might see with challenging behavior and we come to find out that the culprit is underlying acid reflux, perhaps the family notes, you know, after we have our Friday night pizza nights, he always seems to be more irritable and we notice an uptick in those behaviors. Um, and then any obvious triggers that have led to symptoms such as, again, new medications, a change in their environment and so forth. Another important kind of take home message here is that Wherever possible, um, our patients with IDD should be encouraged and taught to communicate when and if they're in pain. So for example, um, if we're able to teach our nonverbal patients or our limitedly verbal patients to point or gesture to areas of discomfort, this can be hugely helpful. And also, again, you know, you you guys know patients best. So um, paying, encouraging special attention um, paid to an individual's vocalizations or behaviors that might be associated with pain. So for instance, one of my patients tends to grind their teeth as a sign, and that has become a sign to parents that something underlying is going on and causing discomfort. Another patient might tap on the side of their head and this is the clue to caregivers that something's wrong. These are just examples. So to end, I wanted to wrap up by reviewing um, a really helpful resource that's available for everyone. This is the Mental Health Therapy Toolkit or Passport Tool that's available online through Nice Songer. This, will, this is one example that we'll review today, but there are many similar such tools available online. Um, and I would encourage everyone to ensure that their um, patients 
have one of these completed because I think that this can be very, very helpful um, for providers in numerous settings. So primary care providers, specialists, this information could be helpful when our patients are seen in more urgent settings like the emergency room as an example. So some information that this um, mental health passport tool collects. So firstly, what order our patients like to go by? What are their preferred names? What's the best way to communicate with a patient? So um, perhaps that's just uh, verbal language. Perhaps that's use of a communication device. Um, perhaps that's written. Uh, there's a section here for accommodation or support that a patient might do well with. So I'll give you some examples of accommodations that we ask about kind of in our um, primary care setting. So we'll ask folks whether um, they should be roomed immediately. Perhaps they don't do well sitting in a waiting room environment and they do best if they're kind of taken back to an exam room quickly. Some of my patients um, have trouble tolerating vital signs checks, so like blood pressure checks, for example, so we'll make note of that. Um, some of my patients prefer either a female or a male provider based on experiences they've had in the past. Um, these are examples of things that can be included here. It's helpful for us to know who are the support um, person or persons who patients prefer to have the, with them. So those people who they're most comfortable with um, certainly a list of a person's disability or disabilities and conditions is helpful, especially when they're seeking care in environments where, where the providers may not be familiar with them and have no idea what their background is. Uh, it can be helpful for us to understand a person's background, culture, um, and things like that. I, um, as a physician, always try to view my patients as people, right? People first, patient second. And I really try hard to not view my patients as just their medical problems. And so um, I love to learn more about my patients, the things they like, the things they dislike. Uh, it can be helpful to understand um, a patient's history. Perhaps, you know, they've had certain traumatic experiences in a medical setting. This can be good information to have. Um, this is not on this specific tool, but things that can be helpful for us. You know, how has a patient done with invasive procedures in the past? So for instance, how do we do with vaccines or with blood draws? Um, if we are able to tolerate those things, what, what helps them succeed? Perhaps it's listening to music or squeezing a loved one's hand really hard, um, just as examples. A couple of other things that are not on this specific form, but again, can be helpful to include. Um, what are typical triggers for a patient? Are there any certain things that we know can be a trigger for challenging behavior? So perhaps it's being touched without a warning. Perhaps it's um, loud noises. And what are signs um, or warning signs of upcoming challenging behavior? Um, this can be really helpful as well for providers. And then lastly, I guess on that same note, um, what are some comfort methods that work well for someone? So if we see that a person's displaying some of those kind of warning signs, as I call them, that there might be an impending challenging behavior, how can we help comfort them? What should we change? So um, in summary, any concern for new or worsening challenging behaviors should prompt an evaluation for underlying medical or environmental causes. And it's important to consider um, the possibility of these causes mm -hmm. before concluding that behaviors are related to an underlying psychiatric diagnosis. And again, um, you know, behavior is communication and we really, really rely on um, information provided by families and caregivers as, as they are the ones who know families best. I'll open it up to questions if there are any.
Thank you, Dr. Cooper, for that presentation. Um, I invite the audience to submit any questions that you might have in the chat. Uh, feel free to raise your hand or I'll pause here if you'd like to interject with a question. But while participants are thinking about what they might like to ask. I just want to reemphasize the helpful acronym or mnemonic device that you provided in going through the, the HELP strategy to think about physical health concerns, environmental concerns, life experiences, and, and potentially psychiatric and psychological conditions. I thought that was really Helpful. One of the things you mentioned, Dr. Cooper, was helping to, to teach people, train them on expressions of pain through gesturing and things like that. Uh, in, in working with some research partners with lived disability experience, we've they've brought up some issues and concerns with using scales that use emojis that are oftentimes maybe abstract. It doesn't really represent how I feel pain. And they often encourage us to think about using more real life photographs. Do you have any recommendations or advice on, on training tools or scales or pictures to help people understand and, um, uh, and, and then communicate instances of their own pain with others? That's a great question. So as a pediatrician and internal medicine doc, I see those uh, pain scales with the emoji smileys um, more often on the on the pediatric side. I will admit I'm I don't use those scales in my practice, and there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, one, inevitably, for any providers on the call today, you'll have had this experience. I'm sure. I always will tell folks. So again, this is more for my conversational patients. I'll say, tell me, you know, how your pain ranks on a scale of one to ten. One being there's hardly any pain, perhaps just some slight discomfort. 10 being the worst pain you've ever had in your life. And I use the example of having a shark biting your arm, right? And you will have patients who look visibly very comfortable and will inevitably tell you that their pain is a nine or a 10. So I don't know. I think the utility of these skills can be challenging. And again, with my population, right, with the autistic population who we know struggle with kind of... Um, uh, facial cues of emotion and pain. I'm just not sure how helpful they are. Um, so admittedly, I'm not using any of those skills kind of in my practice. Thank you for that. Dr. Whitworth. Sorry, my mouse like went away for a second just as I was trying to frantically unmute. Um, thank you, Dr. Cooper, for that presentation. I think as you talk about that HELP acronym, I can't help thinking of, you know, a lot of the folks we work with have these pretty big treatment teams. And it seems like it's just so important to make sure that that physical health piece is one taken care of and that everybody's aware of it. So we don't have someone going to the psychologist or the psychiatrist and saying he's having a lot of self-injury and they think they need to have medicine and we've got PCP. Have you found some effective strategies and I know we talked about this a little bit last week too, to really facilitate that team communication mm -hmm. so that it doesn't maybe always just fall on the individual to have to keep explaining things over and over again and or their support folks. Great question. So yes and no. I, I will say we, and I just provide kind of my experience here at OSU, we are lucky within our CAST program to have built a partnership now with one of our Ohio State um, psychiatrists, which has been very nice because, you know, given that we're in the same institution, we have um, very open lines of communication. We have, you know, biweekly meetings to kind of review patients. And so certainly a model like ours, I think is the best case scenario, but I also appreciate that that's not, that's not the reality everywhere. And, and certainly many of my patients have psychiatrists who they're not seeing at OSU and they're seeing outside groups um, I certainly always um, do my best to try to connect with those folks, whether it's like sending, you know, release of info with our information or trying to connect with them, which is unfortunately often easier said than done. Um, 
I think a, 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 the use of something like that health passport tool can be helpful, right? So that people are on the same page. Um, but yeah, I, I, so again, I think our model is wonderful. I know that that's not universal. That's what I'd say. Yeah, it sounds like maybe just some standardized communication tools yeah. that are going to each of the, you know, each of the treatment teams locations and things of that could also help with the when you've got different systems. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you again, Dr. Cooper, for that presentation. I, I do know that um, some uh, some participants were letting me know that they had an issue downloading the file and I echo. So I went in, did some troubleshooting. I deleted the old file, re-uploaded a hard copy of the file. So if you were having access downloading the presentation slides, please try that again. It should be available to you now. The, the case study file seemed to be downloading fine. And we'll be transitioning now into our case presentation.